Disclaimer, J.K. Rowling flies at midnight. Mrs. Weasley, could I speak with you privately? Hermione had got right to work the next time she went to Grimald Place for her lessons. Specifically, it was time to start giving out her enchanted rings. Of course, Hermione, Mrs. Weasley said. It was just after lunch, and they both had a little spare time. The house was crowded, as usual, but after thinking for a minute, she led Hermione up to her and Mr. Weasley's bedroom. It was naturally tidy, and there were a couple of chairs to sit in, but it still made Hermione all the more uncomfortable for it. "'Mrs. Weasley, I wanted to speak with you and your husband together, but I don't really have time,' Hermione said. "'It would be more appropriate to talk to both of you together, but... "'Hermione, is something wrong?' she asked. "'No, no, not at all. I, I have something I wanted to give to you, but it's more something that the two of you should talk about together. "'You see, I... I was worried about what happened at Christmas, Mr. Weasley being attacked, and he couldn't call for help.' It was just luck that Harry saw him, and he really wasn't supposed to. It was really just luck that anyone found him. Mrs. Weasley nodded sadly. Oh, it was terrible. I don't know what I would have done. Well, I was worried about the fact that he couldn't call for help, she said. So I worked out a way for people to send messages without being noticed. The woman's eyes widened. Well, that's very thoughtful of you, Hermione, but the Order does have a way to send messages discreetly she said. They do, she said in surprise. Uh, I don't mean to be rude, but, but why didn't Mr. Weasley use it then? It's a rather difficult spell, she said hesitantly. He wasn't able to do it when he was injured. What spell is it? Hermione couldn't think of any such at the top of her head. I don't know if I should. It's really only supposed to be for order members. Of course it was. That was sensible, but they really ought to be willing to tell people like her and the Weasley's children who might as well be members at this point. Oh well, at least she had an answer for herself. Actually, Mrs. Weasley, Dumbledore does have me doing some work for the Order. Mrs. Weasley looked horrified by the notion, so she quickly clarified. Nothing dangerous, of course. No god duty or anything like that. Just a couple of academically oriented projects that I could do from the safety of Hogwarts. Or my home now. "'Is that so?' Mrs. Weasley said uncomfortably. "'But he hasn't told you about that spell?' "'No.' She sighed and said, "'I'm still not sure if I should be telling you, "'but it's a spell you would be good at. "'I thought he might have told you. "'You see, it's a variation of the Patronus charm "'that can carry a message with your voice. "'It's impossible to fake, and dark wizards can't even cast it, "'so it's perfect for our use.' If there's a way to convincingly imitate a Patronus in general, it can probably be faked, Hermione thought. Except for the fact that it's very difficult to cast, she replied. But she definitely wanted to learn the spell, nonetheless. I came up with something much easier and still practically unnoticeable. I thought it would be good to have. That certainly got her attention. Truly, Hermione, she said. I know you're brilliant, but you think you developed a better spell than Professor Dumbledore? She shook her head. It wasn't my spell, and it wasn't that hard, either. It's the same spell that's on Sirius and Harry's mirrors, and they seem to think those are secure enough. Ah, I suppose if they think so. So what is it, another mirror? Nothing so obvious, Mrs. Weasley. You see this ring? Hermione held up her left hand, showing the ring on her index finger. She tapped at the ring with her wand, and the elvish letters glowed. Then she used the butt end of her wand to quickly tap out a message on it, changing the script to English letters. The eagle flies at midnight. What does that mean? Mrs. Weasley asked. And what were those runes? I've never seen anything like them. They're both muggle jokes. They're not important. The point is, they can send messages securely, and it's easier and less conspicuous than casting a Patronus. She pulled two more rings from her pocket and held them out to her. Both were glowing with the same message. Mrs. Weasley took the rings and examined them. That is very clever, Hermione. Have you shown these to Professor Dumbledore? No, and frankly I don't intend to. She frowned deeply. Why not? Because I'd really like to keep this separate from the Order. Why, don't you trust Professor Dumbledore? Not after what happened to Sturgis Podmore she snapped angrily. 
Mrs. Weasley recoiled in horror. Hermione backed off. I'm sorry, that was uncalled for. That just hit me hard when it happened. I trust Professor Dumbledore's motives, of course, but I disagree with his actions, and I've spoken to him personally about it. I'm doing work for the Order, but he understands I'm also doing my own thing, within my means, of course. That wasn't exactly true, but Dumbledore probably guessed as much. I'm just not willing to rely solely on him anymore. These rings will give you an alternate way to call for help. You see, if Sturgis Podmore had had one of these rings, maybe he'd still be alive right now. And if Mr. Weasley had had one, maybe he wouldn't have had to rely on Harry's insane luck. Hermione could tell Mrs. Weasley was unhappy with the arrangement, but she was sure she could understand the logic. I suppose you're right about that, she admitted, nodding her head. Honestly, it did worry me what happened to Sturgis. Just being sent to Azkaban was bad enough, and then... So, who have you shown these to? You're the first. I'm only going to give them to people I personally know and trust. I want you and Mr. Weasley to have those two. They're plated, not solid, so you'll be able to resize them easily. I'm going to give them to Sirius and Remus, and I have another two for Fred and George when they graduate. You make it sound like you're trying to build a group of your own, Mrs. Weasley said shrewdly. Not really. These are just to call for help. She smiled a little. I did think of a name, though, if I have a reason for one. It's the... She stopped and chided herself. The Council of Elrond was completely the wrong Tolkien reference for this. The White Council, she finished. Well, be that as it may, how do these rings work? Mrs. Weasley replied. It's a bit limited. The downside of the Protean charm is that it's one to many and many to one. You can send me a message, but nobody else. I can send a message to all the rings, and that's it. So if you are in trouble, you'll need to send a message to me, and I'll relay it to the others. Mrs. Weasley frowned again. Are uh, you sure you should be wearing the master ring then, Hermione? I certainly don't expect you to come to the rescue. I wouldn't need to. I'd just serve as the dispatcher to alert the others. I can send and receive messages from anywhere, and it's not like I'm going to be running into danger any time soon that something should happen to the master ring. Mrs. Weasley sighed. All right, then. Thank you, Hermione. I'm not sure it's the best way, but I'll know I'll feel better if Arthur has one of these. How do I send a message? Do you know Morse code? The what code? Never mind. They also respond to the prisoner's tap code. Here's how it works. Hermione Granger, Arithmancer, Mastery Student under Septim Vector, to David Anderson, President of the MAC USA Arithmancy Society. Dear Mr. Anderson, Thank you for following up on our meeting last month. I'm afraid I've been rather busy with the political situation here in Britain. I appreciate your efforts to relocate Annals of Arithmancy to America. Despite my personal patriotism, right now I'm of the mind that anything that shows to certain local interests that they are not all-powerful is a good thing. I'm confident that relocating would allow Annals of Arithmancy greater journalistic integrity and press freedom in the next several years and possibly longer, and you have my full support. However, I wanted to contact you regarding a possible collaborative arithmancy project I have planned, possibly as my master's thesis. You have read my recent proof with Septima Vector and Rebecca Gamp about the non-transfigurability of radioactive materials. I would like to extend this work to antimatter. If you are unfamiliar with the term, antimatter is a substance that is identical to normal matter, except that the fundamental particles have the opposite electrical charges. Muggle scientists are familiar with antimatter and are able to generate microscopic amounts of it in their laboratories. You may contact any major laboratory for more information. Of greatest concern is that when antimatter comes into direct contact with normal matter, they annihilate each other, resulting in an enormous release of energy, even greater than in muggle nuclear weapons. This is why I very much hope that we can prove that antimatter is not transfigurable. The problems inherent, if it were possible, would be similar, but even greater than those that would occur if it were possible to build nuclear weapons with magic. Indeed, it is the antimatter problem that led me to my work on radioactive material in the first place, and I hope that you can lend your expertise to the subject. I have enclosed my notes to date on this topic for your examination. The proof I have in mind must needs be more theoretical than the previous one. I believe that similar methods will be needed, but there is little, if any, practical experimentation that can be done, 
and the mathematics needed to describe antimatter is considerably more advanced than that needed for radioactive decay. If you require additional explanation, I can point you to several muggle sources on the maths involved. I look forward to our prospective collaboration. Sincerely, Hermione Jean Granger I haven't heard back yet, but he seemed really interested in my work when we met at the awards ceremony, Hermione told Septima in their next meeting when she showed her a copy of her letter. I know Anderson, Septima said. He's good. He's probably one of the few people in the world who understood your proof. And the Mac USA Arithmancy Society probably has the influence to get Annals of Arithmancy to move, especially after the scene Rebecca made. Although I wouldn't be too sure about making this your master's thesis. Why not? I think it would be too esoteric for most people. If the Wizarding Examinations Authority can't understand what you did, they won't be keen to give you your certification. Oh. Now, this fractal geometry you're studying looks very interesting. I'm starting to understand the appeal now that I've got past the mad infinities. Although I have to wonder, you said fractal geometry is mainly a subject of the complex analysis you're studying now? That's right. But you showed me fractals before that only used real analysis or geometry. Yes, but the most mathematically significant fractals use complex analysis. And I wish I had better pictures for you. Muggle computers are just beginning to be good enough to draw these things. What you have here is beautiful, Septima replied, motioning to the multicolored prints of the Mandelbrot set. Now, this here might not be the most practical place to start. I think that a study of the applications of self-similarity to spell creation, and maybe to runes, would be very promising. And if it pays off, the fractals you've shown me are diverse enough that it could be enough for a whole thesis. Hermione hadn't thought of that before. What could she do with fractals and spell creation? Casting multiple spells at once? Some kind of cluster bomb curse? That could be really interesting, she said. Where do you think we should start? Hermione rose from her seat and started writing on her personal blackboard. The key is that with self-similarity, you can define an infinite construction with a closed-form rule, even if it has to be iterated. Now that I've wrapped my mind around it, it's not too different from what we do with power series. We should pick a few simple spell elements and see if we can come up with something analogous that's still castable. Unfortunately, just as they were about to get started, Hermione heard one of the most unwelcome sounds imaginable. Ahem. <clears throat> Dolores Umbridge stood in Septima's doorway. How had she even got in? Actually, never mind. It probably wouldn't be that hard to get around Bridget Wenlock if you were as devious as she. Hermione had flashbacks to her detentions just looking at her. She subtly hid her letter while Septima spoke. Dolores, what a surprise, she said. I could have sworn I left the door closed. Umbridge pointedly avoided that remark. I'm terribly sorry to bother you, Professor Vector. She clearly wasn't. But may I ask what you're doing? Septima took on a more formal pose. I'm teaching, Professor Umbridge, she said. Teaching what? Advanced arithmancy, if you must know. Oh, no, 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 this will not do, Umbridge said with her poisoned honey grin. Surely you haven't forgotten educational degree number 26? Teachers are banned from giving students any information that is not strictly related to the subjects they are paid to teach, Septima quoted in a bored tone. But regardless of what I think of that as a pedagogical practice, it doesn't apply in this case. It most certainly does. All teachers and all students are covered regardless of where they are enrolled. That's not what I meant, Professor Umbridge. Oh, and what did you mean? I mean that I am being paid to teach this class. What on earth do you mean? Advanced arithmancy isn't on the syllabus. Paid by whom? I'm paying Professor Vector a sickle per week to teach me advanced arithmancy, Hermione spoke up. You, Miss Granger? Umbridge's grin cracked into a scowl. But your education... I am receiving a full accredited education from Horace Slughorn, Professor Umbridge, she replied. However, there is no law preventing me from taking additional private classes, and educational decree number 26 doesn't bar Professor Vector from teaching them. Septima shot a grin back at Umbridge and motioned to Hermione. 
what she said. Well, Umbridge huffed, you may rest assured, Professor Vector, that as High Inquisitor I will be reviewing this new development very carefully. I look forward to it, Dolores. Umbridge stormed out, slamming the door behind her. Well, that's got her out of our hair for another week, Septimus said. Now, let's start looking at self-similarity, shall we? Unfortunately, it really was only that week that Umbridge was out of their hair. The next time Hermione saw Harry at the DA, he showed her the latest development. Did you see this, Hermione? he asked, holding up a sheet of parchment. What is it? New educational decree. It showed up on Monday, but I didn't see the point. Hermione took the parchment and read it off. By order of the High Inquisitor of Hogwarts, teachers employed by Hogwarts may not teach any subject that is outside of the Ministry of Magic's secondary education curriculum, nor outside of the class schedule assigned them by the school administration. The above is in accordance with Educational Decree No. 27, signed by Dolores Jane Umbridge, High Inquisitor. I don't believe it, Hermione said. She wrote a whole new decree just for me? That was for you? Yes, I was paying Septima to teach me advanced arithmancy, and she caught us. I told her she didn't have a leg to stand on, and then she did this. Wow, she must really not want you in the castle, Harry said. Or she just doesn't like losing. Actually, come to think of it, she's probably still sore about what Rebecca did at the prize ceremony. This hits her independent study, too. Hmm, I'll need to think of a new plan. <laughs> yes, that's fine for you, he grumbled. The new decree bans remedial potions, too. So Snape changed my occlumency lessons to detentions. Oh, sorry, Harry. Harry was annoyed, but Snape detentions were something he could deal with, especially fake ones. The DA was actually going pretty smoothly that night. Everyone was learning the spells they should have been learning in class for the past four and a half years, and people were mostly getting along, even with Greengrass and Davis. Seamus Finnegan still looked disgruntled, but he was still showing up, at least. The interesting bit came when they were finishing up, and Georgina stopped to talk to Hermione and Greengrass together, much to Hermione's surprise. "'So, Hermione, Daphne?' Georgina asked when she spoke to her. "'Do you think we can bring Astoria into the group?' "'Astoria? I don't think so,' Daphne said. "'But, Daphne, she's my best friend, and I want her to learn this, too.' Oh, that's right, Hermione remembered. Georgina was friends with Daphne's little sister. If she'll sign the contract, it's fine by me, she answered. Harry? Huh? Oh, I guess that's all right, he said. Daphne sighed. She's only a third year, Granger. Excuse me? The second year Georgina spoke up. You know what I mean, Georgina. And you know her situation is different. Daphne added in a lower voice. I can work with her. It won't be that hard for her. Hermione wasn't sure what they were talking about, although she did know there were quite a few younger siblings who were deliberately not being included in the meetings. Well, you can forbid her if you want, Greengrass, she said, but we're okay with it. She should be able to defend herself the best she can, Daphne, Georgina said, and I know she wants to do it too. I'll think about it then, but just for her sake. Not to be outdone, Anthony Goldstein came up to Harry after that and said he thought Terry Boot and Michael Corner would be interested in the group. Parvati was still working on Lavender. So it wasn't much, but Hermione thought they'd made another step towards being a well-rounded group. Hermione had added more and more runes to her magical railgun, with just as many also added to her bullet catcher to keep from shooting through her basement wall. It was an increasingly large amount of work to increase the speed. Energy was portional to the square of the velocity, after all. By now, just charging the runes took a serious effort, but she'd have to tie them into the ley lines or learn a lot more runes if she wanted much more power than that, and she wasn't at that level yet. She'd probably have to forego the rifle rounds for now, but she could at least work her way up to the most powerful handgun rounds in the world. That was the forty four Magnum, or so said Dirty Harry. A check at the library told her that to match that power, her railgun would need to fire a twenty two gram slug at fourteen hundred feet per second. The Creevy brothers had developed her previous pictures with encouraging results. 
As she had expected, the monocular crystals stored video holographically, so frame rate was not a concern in slowing it down. At about a hundredth of the normal speed, they said, the video just became too fuzzy to make out, and that was slow enough for her to actually measure 1400 feet per second. You do realize you've built a working high-powered handgun in your basement, right, Hermione? Her dad said. That's not normal. She rolled her eyes. Dad, when have I ever been normal? It's not safe, Mum said. I know it's working now, but if you actually try it on shields, what about ricochets? Once I can dial in the speed, I'll move the barrel closer to the target and build more shields around the entire testing chamber. It'll be fine. Well, if you're sure, she said. It won't be any more trouble than what I've done already. Hermione checked the setup and started the omnocular recording. Experiment number 17, emulating a 44 magnum round, she said. Fire in the hole. She touched the activation rune, and there was a bright flash that seemed to come from the barrel and the backstop simultaneously, and a crack as the slug broke the sound barrier. But when the dust cleared, it had been caught firmly by the magical backstop. Well, it works, she said. That's all I can do for now. I'll need to get the next batch of pictures developed before moving on. That rather relieved her parents for the moment. She packed up her equipment, and they went about their business. But just a few minutes later, there was a knock on the front door, and to the Granger's surprise, a man who was recognizably dressed as a wizard was standing outside. "'Can we help you?' Dan asked. "'Are you Mr. Granger?' "'I am,' he said cautiously. "'I'm Arnold Peasgood from the Accidental Magic Reversal Squad.' We detected a large discharge of accidental magic at this location not long ago, and we wanted to check it out to see if you needed any help. Is your daughter at home? Yes, she is. Hermione? Hermione's heart was racing. The accidental magic reversal squad? Merlin's pants. They'd detected what she was doing. She should have known throwing this much magic around in a muggle house would get her in trouble, even if it didn't trip the trace. Her eyes darted around the room, and she quickly hid her homemade wands under a sofa cushion before going to the door. "'Yes, Dad?' she said. Peasgood looked surprised when he saw her. "'Are you Hermione Granger?' he asked. "'Yes, sir. Is something wrong?' she said. "'We picked up a large surge of accidental magic from you, Miss Granger. Is everything okay here?' "'Oh, yes, yes, we're fine,' she said with an air of someone who was tired out and relieved that things were sorted." Are you all right, Miss Granger? Accidental magic is very unusual at your age. Yes, I'm fine, Mr. Peasgood, she said with a dramatic sigh. I've just been under a lot of stress lately. You see, I had to start a new tutoring program last month, and, well, it's not important. I was in the basement when it happened, so no one saw it, and most of the energy went into the wall. Uh, yes, her dad said, thankfully catching on. She made the lights flicker up here, but she didn't crack the foundation, thank goodness. No harm done. "'Are you sure about that, Mr. Granger?' the wizard edged forward as if to come inside. "'If you need any assistance at all—' "'We know how to find you,' Dad cut him off. "'Thank you for your concern, but we don't need any help, and Hermione's all right for now.' "'Ah, well then, thank you for your time,' Peasgood turned and apparated away. Dad closed the door, and then both of Hermione's parents turned on her. "'What was that about?' Dad said. I thought you said you couldn't get into trouble with those wands if you made them with your hair or something like that. And I didn't, she insisted. If I'd used my regular wands, it would have been someone from the improper use of magic office. They think this was just an accident. The wands that use my own hair registers accidental magic, but it looks like that last experiment used enough of it that it tripped off their detectors. So you're not in trouble, he clarified. No, but I can't do much magic here any more without raising suspicion. If it was enough to send someone out here, I'm sure it'll get back to Umbridge sooner or later. Oh no, Umbridge. I'll bet anything she told the Ministry to monitor me extra closely for any troublemaking, especially after that last educational decree. Uh, why, to slow down your work? No, spite. That was pure spite, Hermione said. No, scratch that. It was a warning. She's saying, I'm still watching you. She's telling me I can't bend the rules like I have been, and I have to be a good little witch and not work against her. Is that a problem for your tutoring? Mum asked with concern. No, that's fine. Headquarters is under Fidelis. They can't monitor me there. I'll just have to move the experiments I can there. Not this one, probably, but some of the others I might be able to. 
Just so long as you're careful. You're the one who told us how bad that woman is. Maybe you should stop your seminar with Septima. No, Mum, don't worry. I've got a plan for that. Hermione, I'm not sure if you saw the new educational decree, Septima said. I did, Septima, but that's not why I'm here. It's not? No, I was wondering if you would be interested in the new class I'm teaching called Advanced Topics in Mathematics. You see, I checked, and the classes that aren't accredited by the ministry don't require a teaching certificate. Class starts right now, and tuition is one sickle per week. Septima gaped for a moment, then laughed loudly. Hermione, I know you don't like defining people by their houses, but the sheer Gryffindor audacity of that plan is brilliant. Legimens By mid-February, Hermione's occlumency lessons were going much better. Professor Dumbledore had been rougher with her the past few weeks, so that she would be prepared for a tougher assault from a Death Eater, but she was still keeping him out of her mind. She wasn't perfect by any means, but she was good enough that she could block him long enough to react and do something to break eye contact. "'I must admit, Hermione, I'm very impressed with your progress,' he said. "'In fact, I think it is time that we concluded these lessons. You could improve further, of course, but you are proficient enough now to keep your own secrets against anyone you are likely to encounter day to day, and to help Harry to be where he needs to be. Professor Snape has said, though not in so many words, that he has made progress as well. "'Thank you, Professor,' she said sincerely. That was one less thing to worry about, especially since she was on thin ice with Umbridge. "'So what do we do? I can still do more work for the Order,' she offered. She wondered if Mr. or Mrs. Weasley, or Sirius or Remus, had told him about the rings, though she still didn't plan to mention it herself. If Dumbledore knew, he didn't mention it. "'You may recall I asked you to become close with Professor Slughorn,' he said. "'How is that going?' "'He seems to like me. He's been impressed with my work, says I'll do great things. "'He's rather informal for a professor,' she said hesitantly. "'Why?' "'I believe you know that Professor Slughorn taught Voldemort when he was a student. "'The young Tom Riddle was part of his house and was one of his favorites. I believe that Professor Slughorn knows certain information about Voldemort's past that may be key to defeating him. That sounded a little... odd. What? You mean, like, what his one true weakness is, Professor? Or more like where all his secret hideouts are? Dumbledore smiled. It may be closer to that first one than you think, Hermione. I will have more details for you at a later date. I'm still investigating for myself. But I urge you to be cautious in approaching Professor Slughorn about this matter. He was very guarded when I spoke with him last, and I would not want you to hurt your relationship. I know that you need to stay enrolled with him until your next birthday. Unless we get lucky and get rid of Umbridge at the end of the year like all the other defense professors, she countered. That would be convenient, wouldn't it? But alas, the power of a stubborn politician with influence in the press is too great to discount. Yes, the press, she grumbled. Then it hit her. The press. Yes. Just an idea, Professor. I need to go. And write to a certain reporter whom I've still got by the antenna for another four months. She hurried to the door, but she stopped for one last question. Professor, I'm sorry if I was intruding, but I was talking to the people at headquarters, and they said that you invented a spell for the order to communicate secretly? Dumbledore's eyebrows rose in surprise. I am surprised someone told you that, Hermione, but I suppose it's no great risk. It is a variation on the Patronus charm that can carry a message. I could teach it to you if you like, but Remus is perfectly capable, and I think that would be more convenient for you. Thank you, Professor. So it's secure? Yes, you cannot fake someone's Patronus, Hermione, he said. She nodded and walked out the door, still doubtful of his claim. Somewhat to Hermione's surprise, Harry contacted her through Sirius's mirror and told her that Astoria Greenglass would be coming to the next DA meeting. Hermione couldn't make it to every meeting, but she made an effort to attend this one to help smooth things over. Astoria looked a lot like a younger version of Daphne, but with brown hair and thinner and paler than her sister. She was bright-eyed and eager, but she also looked like a strong wind might blow her over. Michael Corner and Terry Boot from Ravenclaw had also joined this week. "'It's good to meet you, Astoria,' Hermione told her, shaking her hand. "'Georgine has told me a lot about you.' "'Good things, I hope,' Astoria replied cheekily. 
She said you're no fan of umbrage, and you want to learn to defend yourself properly. That's good enough for me. Come on, Astoria, I'll work with you, Georgina said, and led her friend to the side of the room. With Georgina as Astoria's partner, Dennis had to partner with Colin, so there was a bit of reshuffling, but once they got started, things were going pretty well. Hermione faced off against Luna to start. So, Luna, I wrote your father last week. I don't know if he told you, she said. He did. We have ways to communicate without raising suspicion. Somehow she wasn't surprised. That's good. He said he trusts me to handle it, but you're welcome to come to lunch if you want. I think I will. It should be interesting. I think we should do it at the Three Broomsticks, though. The Three Broomsticks? Why, the Hogshead is a lot less crowded. Exactly. It's too easy for spies to listen in there. And it's a less savory crowd, too. If Professor Umbridge catches you there... Hmm, she wouldn't have a legal leg to stand on, but she could probably try something. Right, Hermione agreed. Okay, then, I'll meet you at the Three Broomsticks at noon on Saturday. I'll sort things out by then. Saturday, a familiar voice called. Doth mine ears deceive me? You're going on a lunch date with our little Luna? It's a business meeting, George, Hermione said, rolling her eyes. But you know this is Valentine's weekend in Hogsmeade, don't you? George said. I was just about to ask you. I'd love to, George, but we'll have to skip lunch. I'm sorry, but we could only do this on a Hogsmeade weekend, and it'll really strike back the ministry. It's just for lunch, though, and the rest of the day, I'm yours. George brightened and flashed her a provocative grin. I like the sound of that, he said. And get your mind out of the gutter. Anyway, I have to talk to Harry and Cedric. Harry was surveying the group, giving pointers to people as needed. He'd really grown into the teaching role, especially now that Hermione couldn't come every time. They're really coming along, he told her when he saw her. Yes, they are. You know, I was thinking maybe we could try to teach them the Patronus charm. Really? Hermione said in surprise. I was thinking about it, but it's a very advanced spell. Not all of them will be able to do it. A lot will. We learnt it, didn't we? Yes, but with months of hard work. But if you think we should try it, we can. It couldn't hurt. Although we still have catching up to do for Remus's syllabus. Yeah, but soon, I think. All right. Listen, Harry, this is really important. She changed the subject. You too, Cedric. She called the head boy over. I need you two to come meet me for lunch at the Three Broomsticks on Saturday. Saturday, Harry said. I have a date with Ginny, though. It's... Valentine's weekend, I know. I have a date with George, too. I'd say Ginny and Cho could come, but we can't be having too many people without attracting attention. You really need to be there, though. This'll finally give you a way to stick it to Umbridge. It will? How? Hermione grinned. By using one of her favorite weapons against her, the press. Harry and Cedric stared at her in surprise, but they could find no reason to doubt her. Well, Cho's not going to like it much, but I think she'll understand. Cedric agreed. I'll see you there. Yeah, I'll be there, Harry agreed. But you have to deal with Ginny's temper. Hermione wasn't afraid of Ginny. Much. Everything seemed well set. But towards the end of the meeting, something most unexpected happened. Without being hit by a spell, Astoria stumbled and collapsed. The other Slytherins rushed to her side, as did Hermione, and she didn't like what she saw. Astoria had looked pale when she came in, but it was worse now. Daphne started to help her to her feet, but Hermione managed to worm her way in to check her over first. She's fine, Granger, Daphne insisted. It's okay, it's okay, Astoria said weakly. Just need a break. I just want to help, Hermione said. She doesn't look so good. Astoria looked even worse up close. She was out of breath, despite an easy session, and Hermione could see the pallor in her lips and gums. She saw white nail beds, too, as she took the girl's pulse. Her heart was racing. I think she's sick, Daphne, she said. She's just tired. Daphne, my parents are trained as healers. She's not tired. She's anemic. She needs to see Madame Pomfrey. She'll be fine, Daphne started. Madame Pomfrey already knows, Georgina cut in. Georgina, Daphne and Astoria both said indignantly. I know Hermione, girls. She just wants to help. Hermione, Astoria's... She glanced at her friend, who looked distinctly uncomfortable. Well, Madame Pomfrey knows, and she's doing what she can. That's all you need to know. But Astoria needs to take it easy here. 
I'm sorry, I didn't mean to intrude, Hermione said uneasily, wondering what form of anemia could affect witches like this. I was just worried for her. She hesitated and looked at Daphne. You didn't have to let her come. I wanted to, Astoria said, still catching her breath. Even if I can't do all of it, I still need to learn what I can. You could have told me, Hermione said. I have a few spells that are designed to be easier to cast and don't take a lot of energy. Yeah, that'd be good. Why don't you sit down for a few minutes? I'll get back to you soon. Astoria nodded, and Georgina led her back to the side of the room to rest. Hermione looked back at Daphne. You don't have to tell me. Then I won't, Daphne snapped. Just as long as she's getting good care, Hermione said. If Daphne was impeding her sister somehow... She is, she insisted. I just don't want her looking weak in front of the other houses. Fine, I'll do what I can that won't be too hard for her. Daphne still didn't look happy with the situation, but she eventually grumbled. Thanks, Granger. Astoria did considerably better when Hermione gave her a few simpler spells like her flashbang hex to work with. She wondered if there were spell books that were designed specifically for people who weren't very strong witches and wizards, or who had a chronic illness or a disability of some kind. There might not be, she thought, since wizards were so much healthier than muggles on average, but maybe Mr. Filch's quick spell courses had something like that in it. Either way, Astoria was grateful for the help, and Hermione resolved to keep a closer eye on her when she could.